there. I'm Laura Domala from Slowboat.com. I'm Sam Lanzen from Slowboat.com. And I'm Kevin Morris from Slowboat.com. And today we're going to talk about how to prepare your boat for Alaska. One of the most important things as you get ready to head north to Alaska is you really need a different mindset than if you've been cruising closer to home and fewer hours per year. The distances involved are pretty great. We're talking two to 3,000 nautical miles, maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in an eight knot trawler type boat or cruising at eight to 10 knots on any boat really, you're looking at putting upwards of 400 hours on your main engine. So you're gonna be doing maintenance during your trip. Right, it's pretty typical if you're cruising up to even the Broughtons or that kind of area that you get your oil changed before you head north and then again when you get home. But on this kind of a trip, you're just moving too many hours yeah. for that to happen. So most diesel engines require oil changes every 200, 250 hours, gas engines more frequently than that. And you'll need to be doing that during the trip. Right, when we go to Alaska, we carry enough supplies to do oil changes twice during the trip. and the mentality that you might have if you cruise closer to home where you sort of fix or check on each thing on kind of an as needed basis you really need to change that when you're on a long expedition like this and start with everything at one point keep track of the hours and the times for things so that you're doing your maintenance on a more organized and coordinated schedule and particularly that you're doing it in places where there are parts and service and things available if something goes wrong when you're in the middle of the maintenance. Right. The other thing is things are going to fail on your boat. Things will break. I don't think any of us has ever had a whole summer in Alaska that we didn't have things break on the boat. And you just need to go in knowing that, expecting that. And we're going to talk through some things you can do beforehand to get the boat ready and good spare parts to carry with you on the trip. Right. Also, do you want to talk a little bit about maintenance-induced failures? Well, yes, because a lot of people have this idea of like, okay, I'm going to go to Alaska. It's going to be a several month trip and hundreds right. of miles. And I'm going to do all the maintenance before I leave. Literally the day before they start heading north, they're doing a lot of maintenance projects and replacing impellers and doing things like that. And that's not the best plan because a lot of times the thing that breaks, breaks because something went a little bit wrong during maintenance. Something changed and you forgot to do one thing or didn't tighten this well enough. Or... Right, a gasket didn't seat properly, yeah. something wasn't tightened, something wasn't connected. So you should and... build in a little time, right? If you do all your maintenance and then you want to go out and cruise around a little bit. and Yeah, go use the boat, see what you can break yeah. uh, while you still have an easy way to fix it at home with your usual mechanics and access to parts. Yep. Right. I'd want at least 10 or 12 hours on the engine, a couple of start and stop cycles after any maintenance that I did before I head off on a big expedition. Into the boonies. Well, let's talk about spares. Sam, why don't you talk about spares? You're like, <laughs> we call Sam the Napa Auto Parts of the Sea. <laughs> yes, I believe we were anchored in an excursion in last summer and you said, hey, I need a two and a half foot length of double No, we, we were cable. on the outside of Chichigoth. We were on the outside yeah. of Chichigoth. Wherever we were, I popped into the engine room and I come up with this perfect length of double lock <laughs> exactly cable, what we even needed. in the right color. Right. It was on the positive side, so we needed red, and Sam, of course, had red double so, lot. So I'm a big fan of carrying spare parts, and there's a few reasons for this, and a few basics to get out of the way first. I carry spares for any wear items that are going to be needed during the trip. I don't want to be running around town somewhere trying to figure out where I can get the same oil that I've been using, yeah. or where I can find that impeller, or whatever else. So I carry enough oil and filters for all the oil changes I expect to do on the main and the generator during the trip. I carry fluids for everything. If there are leaks in any of the systems with fluids, to be able to fill that system back up. And then critical items that can stop or end a trip. So for example, anything on the serpentine belt on the front of my engine, if any one component fails, the entire system doesn't work. Right. Uh, and, and if it doesn't work, then the engine coolant pump doesn't work. And then I'm dead in the water. So I carry spares for every single thing on the front end of that engine. And then low cost items. You should have light bulbs and fuses and even things like pumps. We'll talk more about that later. But a lot of things are pretty inexpensive that are handy to have. That would make your life way easier if you yeah, needed them. There's nothing more infuriating than spending hundreds of dollars to overnight a $20 part to yeah. where you are. Yeah, right. that but, can be avoided. But a lot of the things that could go wrong that are non-critical, it is perfectly reasonable to get things shipped up to Alaska yeah. or along, mm -hmm. you know, along just, the inside passage. So it's not like you have to carry an entire spare head or anything like that. Yeah, it no, can just be expensive. You're That's not it. crossing an ocean here. You're close to land. You're generally pretty close to some kind of services, no more than 50 to 100 miles from from mm -hmm. services. So you're not totally out on your own. So let's right. dive into some specifics. Let's look at the main engine because that's sort of the heart and soul of the boat going north. And let's talk about some specific things there. Yeah, the most basic stuff you need to have and everybody that's cruising, I think if you're cruising anywhere on a boat, you should have these things. You need to have impellers, fuel filters, belts, and some zincs. Most engines have zincs in the cooling system somewhere. And impellers are a wear item. They fail frequently and they're pretty inexpensive, under $100 for every impeller I've ever seen. 
and they're generally reasonably easy to replace with basic tools. Fuel filters, absolutely essential to have on board. Most boats have primary and secondary fuel filtration and you need to have fuel filters for both. Carry a bunch of these and replace them when you start to see vacuum on the vacuum gauge. Right, because if that's a problem, you can keep replacing as you need to until you can get new fuel and get the problem dealt with. Mm -hmm. Right, we've had a couple of times where we've had a little bit of bad fuel and it's clogged our primary fuel filter and we have a Raycor with the dual, so we switched to the secondary one and that would take us 10 or 20 more hours and then that would get clogged. And so then we'd swapped out and switched back to the first one. And finally we'd get that batch of fuel cleaned up and get new fuel. And But there have been a few times when having multiple filter cartridges and having the dual filter has kept us running when we otherwise might've been stuck. Yeah, Raycor makes the duplex filters, which are really nice because the moment that you start to have a problem with fuel delivery, you can mm -hmm. just throw a valve and you're on a new fresh filter, which if you've ever been in a situation where you plugged up a fuel filter and the engine stopped and it's normal, going to be rough out and your engine room is 115 degrees and you're bleeding injectors and it's a recipe for seasickness and certainly not fun. So the duplex Raycors are a great thing to have and then carrying spare cartridges as well. Right and fluids like we said earlier you want to have enough oil and filters for the oil changes that you'll need to do throughout your trip. Right carry some extra coolant it's not uncommon to have hose clamps vibrate loose a little no, bit. No and, it's not and have that uncommon. Leaks. <laughs> One tip that I like to tell people is keep the white diapers as absorbent pads yeah. underneath your machinery at all times and know what color the various fluids are in your engine. Oil is going to be black after just a few hours. Diesel is typically red. If you bought it in the U.S. at a fuel dock, it can be more of a yellowy color if you buy it in Canada. And then coolant comes in a variety of colors. But having the diapers underneath the engine allows you to see at a glance if there's been any fluid leaking, and then you can address that problem before it becomes an issue. I carry quite a bit more in the spare parts category. And part of the reason is because my boat, like yours, Kevin Laura, is a single engine. And so there's, yeah. I got to keep that thing going or I'm dead in the water. And so I like carrying a starter, an alternator, spare raw water pump, spare fresh water pump, spare thermostat. I carry, of course, the belts and the idler pulley and the belt tensioner. I even carry spare injectors. There's no such thing, I don't think, as too many spare parts. But certainly start off with the basics and build up to carrying more based on what you're comfortable with. And single engine boats typically carry more spare parts than twins. Right. And it seems like with each issue we've had, we've added spare parts. <laughs> One last bit of advice on this topic is if anything fails in your engine, Engine, order two of that part because it'll fail again at some point and it's good to have on hand. Most of these parts don't wear out. I know some people who actually vacuum seal the parts so they aren't exposed to any salt air or anything like that. And one other thing that you could do is when you buy a spare part, install that spare part in your engine. This serves a couple of purposes. One, it ensures that the part actually fits on the engine. Two, it makes sure that you have the tools to install it on board. And three, it confirms that you have the ability to fix the problem or, or right. replace the part. Yeah, and modern diesel are very, very reliable. So it's not meant to be a fear thing to be carrying all these spares. But if it's your only way to get from place to place and to keep your boat going, it's really nice to have the peace of mind that you have most of the common things that could go wrong with you. All right, let's talk about the main engine must-dos. There are a few points in the engine that are typical trouble spots. And probably the most significant maintenance item on a modern marine diesel is the cooling, cooling system. Cooling system, right. And there are a lot of coolers here. There's typically a heat exchanger, there's an intercooler, an aftercooler, there's a transmission cooler, there might be a fuel cooler, an oil cooler, and on most engines there's salt water on one side of this and coolant on the other. So these components need coolant drained out, have the coolers all pulled off the engine, clean, pressure tested, reassembled, and then put new coolant in. This is an every two to three year kind of deal on both your main engines and your generators. And particularly the raw water that's getting pumped out of the sea through your cooling system and back out is kind of the lifeblood of the whole system. And the raw water impeller is definitely a wear item. You definitely want to replace it before your trip. As we said, give it a little burn-in time after that before you leave on the trip. Hopefully it won't be burning. Hopefully it will not be burning. <laughs> <laughs> and by burn-in time. <laughs> and replace that religiously on the intervals that it says. And one thing to watch when you're replacing the raw water impeller, you also want to look carefully to see if any of the veins have broken off and if they're missing. If they're missing, you need to go into the heat exchanger and find them because the broken off veins can find their way into the heat exchanger, clog it up so that water can't flow through and can actually cause heating problems. And 
In general, just keep an eye on the temperature of your engine religiously as you go. Know what temperature your engine normally operates at for any given load in RPM. So you know if anything changes. Right, and if it gets even a few degrees off of that, something is different. Find out what's different and go and fix it. Get in the engine room when you're underway and the engine has some load on it. Run it up at high speeds for five or ten minutes mm -hmm. and if you're not used to running it at those RPMs. And basically just really get to know your engine. I know that we've talked about this a lot amongst ourselves. That right. We don't always know if we're imagining a new sound or if it's actually a new sound, but super tune in to what sounds the engine's making, what smells it's making. So get in the engine room. Sometimes you'll discover a leak of some fluid because it'll be leaking onto a hot surface and you'll smell something. Right. And by the time you get in there when it's cold, it will have evaporated yep. and the smell will have dissipated. So get you'll in, never know. Get in there with a flashlight and look all around it while it's running. Look yeah. underneath it. Make sure there's no chafe on engine hoses. And diesel engines vibrate a lot and hoses tend to chafe through. And anytime you're crawling around your engine while it's underway, by the way, be very careful of clothing getting caught in the belts and so forth. Remember there are moving parts that are very dangerous in the front of it. So just always be cautious of where your whole body is in relation to the engine, especially in a tight engine room. Mm -hmm. Another thing to look at and really inspect carefully is the raw water pump. Do they impel or annulate or by whatever the manufacturer's spec is like Kevin mentioned, but these raw water pumps start weeping before they fail typically. So they have a weep hole in the bottom of the shaft and there's seawater on one side and oil on the other side. And if you're seeing either fluid leaking out of it, you need to address that as quickly as you can because it's not going to repair itself. Itself. In most cases, you'll need to have the pump either rebuilt or replaced. And these can be kind of expensive and difficult to get off the engine, but they're absolutely critical. The engine won't run for long without them. Right. Another thing is oil changes, of course. Almost every boater I know is pretty good about keeping up with their oil and filter changes, but do them by the book according to what your operation manual says for the oil change intervals. Keep track of that. Another thing we do and find really valuable and also just giving a lot of peace of mind is with every oil change, we send a sample off to the lab to be analyzed. We use a place called Black stone labs and they send you back a little report card and they actually analyze and tell you how much of different metals are in the oil that's been running in your engine and that can be an early warning sign for things like bearing and ring failure and various other engine components. They'll tell you how much copper and various alloys are and what kind of failure that might indicate or might not indicate. So we're always really excited to get our little like, oh look, our engine got a good report <laughs> card from the, uh, the analysis lab. Well, and they'll recommend, for us, the last few times they've recommended extending right. our hours between oil changes, and that's always kind of interesting. Finally, replace the fuel filters when they exceed the vacuum spec that the manufacturer gives, or you start to see the needle inching out of the green and into the yellow or the red. And one thing to note about this is if you're running a higher output diesel at low output, like we do in our boats, I'm running at pretty low engine load most of mm -hmm. the time, there's often not enough fuel flow, even when they're starting to clog up, to register on, on the, the vacuum vacuum, especially yeah. at low speed. So at wide open throttle, you get a much more accurate measure of how much vacuum and obstruction there is in the fuel system. Right. On our engine, for example, we have a 260 horse Yanmar that we run at fairly low loads most of the time, and it doesn't generate enough deflection on the vacuum needle. Even when the filter gets completely clogged to the point that it's making the engine start to run rough, you won't see it on the vacuum gauge. So if your engine starts to run rough, one of the first things to check is always that you have a clogged fuel filter. And that's, in our case, been the case 100% of the time. You might notice we haven't mentioned air filters here. And unlike a car or a truck, marine diesels operate in a really clean environment in terms of air. And so I find that air filters rarely, if ever, get clogged up. It's something to look at and keep in mind, but it's not an item that normally causes any trouble on marine diesels. All right, let's talk about ground tackle. For Alaska, you really need the ability to anchor in about 100 feet. We've got yeah. a lot of deeper anchorages than you might be used to. We've got Rocknas on our boat. We really like Rockna, but Ultra and Man and Supreme. There are other good ones as well. Yeah, I think the technique has almost as much to do, if not more, yeah. uh, than the anchor itself. So being comfortable anchoring out is really important. And part of that is having ground tackle that's up to the task. And that extends far beyond just your anchor and your chain. Right. Mm -hmm. It includes having a spare anchor so that if you snag a logging cable or, you, having or to cut. you don't have to rush 200 miles to the nearest port or whatever, maybe the weather is not good and you need to stay another night. And mm -hmm. So having a spare anchor and road is important. In Alaska also, there are no recreational marinas the way we would find in the lower 48 and virtually no mooring balls. So you're going to be anchored a lot more than you would say in Puget Sound or the San Juan Islands or any place like that. So it's really important to have ground tackle that you can trust. And having a windlass that's up to the task is really important. When I bought my boat, it came with a combination road. So it had maybe a hundred feet of chain and then a couple hundred feet of line. And Which is what we have on ours. Right. I scrapped it, made that the spare and put 300 feet of chain on the boat. Mm -hmm. And the first time I pulled it up with the windlass, it worked. The second 
second time it pulled up most of it and then it ground to a halt. And so the guideline is, is typically that the maximum load on the windlass needs to be at least three, maybe even four times the total weight of any line you have on there and the chain. And so in my case, that is looking at almost 400 pounds of ground tackle wow. that can be sitting on the bottom. And so the windlass that I ended up buying actually has a 1,900 pound rating. And I feel better pulling in, especially if I have to anchor multiple times, you know, maybe it didn't set the first time mm -hmm. and, and maybe it didn't set the second time. And I've been pulling the anchor in and out and in and out. And it's nice having some margin of safety there for when you're anchoring. The last thing you want is a windlass failure with your expensive ground tackle sitting on the bottom. Yeah, that would be a bummer. Right, and it's just not gonna be practical to haul in a hundred and something feet of chain and an anchor by hand if your windlass fails either. That's No, some windlasses do have manual recovery kits which you can purchase which are slow but usable and so I recommend having that and the other thing you could do is if you have to leave it behind and go to the city and get replacement parts you can tie off fenders to it perhaps or some kind of buoys and then you can come back later and pick it up. Chain and anchors are pretty pricey. If your windlass is more than about five years old good to pull the motor off of it take the motor to an electrical motor shop and have them service it or a hydraulic if it's a hydraulic windlass and make sure just inspect the whole thing read the manual see if there are any points you're supposed be greasing or lubricating or cleaning or, or whatever. Every windlass is a little bit different, but follow the book recommendations and make sure the windlass motor is in good condition. All right, let's talk about our heating systems now. Alaska's cold, right? How do we stay warm? Our boats are equipped with diesel furnaces, which are nice, but I wouldn't say they're an absolute must have for a trip to Alaska. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only part that I see fail with any frequency on the furnaces seems to be the glow plug. Glow they're, plug, right. And those we are replaced, inexpensive. We replaced ours. Carry a spare with you, yeah. but beyond that, it's more thinking about alternatives. How else could you keep the boat warm? Well, there's the heat from the main engine when you're under wave. Right. Most boats have some kind of a bus style, car style heater that comes mm -hmm. off the main engine. And there are electric heaters, but you really can only use those when on shore power if your generator's running, because typically an electric heater takes a lot of power. Mm -hmm. It's good to think through all your systems, not just the heating system. What would you do if it failed? And if you can't fix it, how can you work around it? Well, let's move on to generator. In Alaska and up the inside passage, you're going to go many days at a time with no access to shore power. So it's pretty important to have a generator or something that will help meet your power needs. And it's also important to make sure that before you leave, your generator is well serviced. So you want to be sure that like your main engine, your generator is also up to date on things like oil and filter. And you want to carry like your main engine, an extra change of oil and filters. Your generator also has a raw water impeller. You want to be sure to have a fresh one in there and have at least spare. one spare with you. Fuel filters. And just to add a little bit to this, I carry a spare raw water pump for the generator and that's super helpful to have. I've had that fail actually out and about. There was a bad batch of them and it was nice to have a spare, but it probably a little bit overkill for most people. And again, think about the alternatives. What if your generator fails? How can you get by without it? Shore power is one option, but having an alternator and battery bank and inverter that's sized so that if you're running the boat every day, it'll charge up enough. You don't have to use the generator. Bigger boats have a problem typically with that, but smaller boats, you can set it up so that really if you're running the boat for more than a few hours every day, you don't need the generator to... Right. That that is my recommendation. It gives you some redundancy. And in combination with the solar and the battery bank that we have, I think we didn't run our generator for about the first month mm -hmm. on our trip up to Alaska last summer because we were running long enough days that everything was charged up enough for one night at Anchorage. We didn't need a yeah. generator. So that was, was kind of nice. I think we went about three weeks straight without weeks. hooking up to shore power or running the generator yeah. because we always generated enough from our alternator underway to keep the batteries charged for overnight. And we were running a lot of the day. Most generators also have automatic shutdown systems that protect themselves in the event of high temperature or low oil pressure. And it's not terribly uncommon for these sensors to fail or a connection to get loose. And so it's good to be familiar with the automatic shutdown system on your generator and know how to troubleshoot that. They vary by manufacturer. If you have a Northern Lights gen set, their support at the factory is awesome. You can call them and actually reach a human being and they're knowledgeable in my experience and very responsive. They also have a really good hands-on class they offer periodically. Nice. And so if you own a Northern Lights generator, it's worth contacting the company and seeing when one of these classes is, because you'll learn more about your specific equipment at that class than any generic diesel engine presentation could, That's great. could provide. Let's talk house batteries a little bit. If you're used to going marina to marina, you may not ever put much stress on your house batteries, but when you're spending as many nights and as many nights in a row at anchor as you will be on a trip like this, it's important that you have adequate house batteries in good condition. So before you head north, take your boat out and use it with no shore power. 
even if you're on a dock or something that has power, unplug and just make sure your batteries are adequate. Right, that's a really good idea. And what you're gonna be watching for is, at a basic level, do your batteries supply enough power, the power that you'd need to have a typical night at anchor after the time you would have turned your generator off and before you need to get going the next morning. A little more advanced, you wanna check and see if your batteries hold the appropriate voltage under load. With a certain amount of current going out, are they maintaining the usually 12 point something to 13 point something volts that you'd expect? Do they deliver the rated capacity that they're supposed to deliver? In other words, if it's a 400 amp hour battery, is it still going pretty strong by the time you've taken 200 amp hours out of it? Right, and remember that most battery types should not be discharged more than 50%. Right, that's a really good point. If they're maybe a 400 amp hour battery bank, you don't want to take more than 200 amp hours out. And for AGM batteries and other sealed kind of batteries, one thing we recommend is that you have installed one of these meters that checks to see how much you've taken out and put back in. Magnum makes one, several companies make one, and they'll give you sort of a state of charge that's not based on voltage, but based on actually how much energy that you've taken out of the battery and how much has been used. And that'll help you not over drain your batteries and damage them. All right, let's talk about water systems. We don't have a water maker, but you've got a water maker. New installed last year. Yeah, and I carry almost no spares for my water maker. The reason for this it's is a luxury is item. Pretty simple. <laughs> I tend to keep the water tank full. It's a 12 volt water maker. I run it every day when I'm underway. My water tank tends to vary between about a 30 gallon range of full to 120 gallons. Mm -hmm. And so even if the water maker were to fail, I'd have quite a bit of buffer before I needed to go and find water elsewhere. We carry a couple of spare six gallon jerry jugs of fresh water too, just as a backup. Yeah, I do too. And I think this is really important for a few reasons. One, if you have a water maker, there's always a chance that some component will fail and it will somehow pump seawater into your tank. So hypothetically, if the membrane failed while it's making water and it didn't shut itself down because of high salinity, you'd be filling your fresh water tank with seawater uh, and make it all undrinkable. The other big reason to carry some spare water in a separate place is if you have a leak somewhere in your water system that dumps all your water into the bilge. So imagine you're out in your dinghy exploring and you come back and a hose popped off of a fitting and suddenly you've emptied your entire freshwater tank into your bilge and you're three days from Fun. the nearest town. Also a good reason to keep enough beer on board. Uh, <laughs> that way you won't go thirsty at least on your trek into town. Well, and we recommend carrying a spare water pump, of course, in case your water pump fails, you don't want to have no access to water. And Kevin mentioned the maintenance-induced failure a few slides back, and I replaced my 17-year-old domestic water pump a few years ago, and I thought it was time. And I put the new one in, and it works great for about three months, and then the brand new water pump failed, and I put the old spare back in, and it's been working ever since, and I, <laughs> I bought another spare. But the water pumps do fail. I've seen it fairly frequently, and most of the water pumps are in the several hundred dollar range, so this is not a super costly spare part to have. And think if you have freshwater toilets, if your yeah. domestic fresh water pump fails, you have no way to flush the toilet anymore. That's right. And we'll talk more about that system in a little bit. Kind of the strangest failure I've seen routinely on boats that I've taken up on flotillas to Alaska is the water heater. I've had one a year at least, and last year we had two fail. And huh. there, there are various failure modes. Some of them are just a valve on the outside that fails. Some of them are an internal leak somewhere. The most insidious is that it's connected to the coolant system, and the coolant system is pierced, and then coolant ends up in your fresh water system, which is cool and is antifreeze, yeah. and we know how toxic that is. Yeah. So that's really bad news. So I'm recommending now people replace water heaters at 10 years. No matter what kind of condition it's in, most of the water heaters, those cube style C-word water heaters, mm -hmm. are pretty inexpensive, several hundred dollars. And I had a guy last year that his failed in British Columbia and he shipped one up to Alaska and he paid, I think, $600 in shipping on a $400 water heater. Wow. So go ahead and just replace it before you leave home. All right, on to steering systems. Modern hydraulic steering systems are super reliable, but there are a few things to do before you leave. Inspect it for leaks. Right. Take a clean piece of paper towel maybe and rub it on all of the fittings and see if you get any grease showing up, any fluid showing up. Carry some spare fluid with you so that you have ability to refill the system if, if you, you do. did have a leak mm -hmm. and needed to wait. Also, we've been talking recently about emergency tillers. Yeah, and steering is one of those systems that without it, you're really dead in the water. Your yeah. bow thruster is not going to be very helpful for any length of time or in rough conditions or anything right. like that. And an emergency tiller, if you have a way to fit it, is a really nice thing to have on board. It gives me great peace of mind knowing that I could still control the boat even if the main steering system failed. Okay, electrical systems. We carry a clamp style voltmeter and that's been super helpful. What else, Kev? Yeah, the multimeter we use all the time. Anytime yeah. something even slightly odd is going on electrically, the first thing that comes out well, is 
well, the meter. Sam, I, you were using it to check leakage, right? Or you were yeah, getting well, some... I, I was checking the boats around me at the marina to yeah. see if they were uh, <laughs> leaking current into the water. Doubles as a fun toy. <laughs> also, of course, you want to carry, especially any critical fuses and at least one or two you know, high capacity circuit breakers. So that if you have a breaker fail, you can replace it. It's generally okay in an emergency to replace a breaker that fails with a higher current limit one. You want to change it for the correct breaker when you get back to civilization, but as something to keep you going underway, it's okay to use an upsized breaker. So carry at least one or two upsized breakers in addition to all the critical fuses. Sort of do a survey of your boat and look for any of those little inline fuses because those can be really insidious. Something can stop working, the whole circuit can look like it's right, and then you'll find somewhere a wire with one of those little inline fuses in it and just carry an assortment of anything like that that your boat might be depending on. It's also good to carry an assortment of connectors, butt connectors, and various things in the various wire gauges so that you can make connections and repairs underway, a little bit of heat shrink tubing, and a good set of wire cutters, crimpers, and strippers, the things that you would need to fix any wiring related problems, as well as a few different gauges of spare wire. Uh, as we said earlier, Sam was carrying some double lot battery cable, the really huge stuff, and we always carry... Why did you have that? Oh, it was left over from a... Uh... <laughs> upgrading the inverter. Right. I think I'd put larger cables on it. Those were the old ones. But also more likely to have a failure with one of the smaller gauge things. So just carry some 16, some 10, some 8 a little bit that you can fix anything that might go wrong in those sizes. And electrical is the area that I think confuses people the most. Yeah. It's hard for people to see electricity and that's one of the ways this clamp meter is super helpful. You can clamp it around a positive or a negative wire and you can see what is going through that wire in, in amps. And that's a neat way to look to at learn. the electrical system. A really good resource to have on board is Nigel Calder's Boat Owner's Mechanical and Electrical Manual. And this is not a manual like you'd expect your boat to come with. This is a how-to guide and it really helps demystify any number of issues on your boat. And every boat going to Alaska should have it on board. Yeah, on a related note, something we've had save us a few times if we were in a place that we had cell service was using <laughs> our smartphone to watch <laughs> YouTube videos. Yeah, uh, yeah. We had a problem with the carburetor on our dinghy motor and I needed to know how to remove and rebuild that carburetor. Because we hadn't and done that before. We'd yeah. never done that before. So I just found a YouTube video that showed our exact engine and a guy mm. pulling the carburetor off and rebuilding it. And there it was, a video with step-by-step -step instructions delivered right to me. So YouTube is a great resource for little how-tos of various repair things. So we're moving on to the head now. This is Fun topic. a topic that you don't pay much attention to until it stops until working. Until you do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not anybody's favorite job but it's worth spending a little time on. If you have two heads or more on the boat, you have a little bit more flexibility because you can always use the other. You have a spare. Otherwise, the spare might be a bucket. <laughs> and they do make handy little seats that can go on the top of a standard five-gallon bucket in an emergency, which is this a pretty one, nice thing to have. This one here is from Cabela's. It's called the Luggable Lou. <laughs> but you can buy the little seat top thing just to put on whatever bucket you have around in it, an emergency. The, the better alternative, I think, is yeah. to, to maintain your head. Yeah. Really take care of it well. Make sure that guests are are not putting things in there that they shouldn't and then have a rebuild kit on board and know how to rebuild the head. Nobody's favorite thing to be sitting in an anchorage somewhere and you're <laughs> rebuilding the head but it beats using the luggable loo for the next two weeks while you uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. get home. Also very important in the lower 48, Puget Sound, San Juans, you're used to always using pump outs but when you're in Alaska there are no pump outs whatsoever so you will be using your macerator and dumping overboard so be sure that it works, be sure you know where it is be sure that when you're in that mode, you open your through hole for it. And then of course, before you get back to where they inspect and make sure that your through hole is fastened closed, you need to fasten it back closed for returning to normal civilization. But be sure you know about your macerator and that it's working correctly. And I carry a spare macerator. It's again, a relatively inexpensive part. And even though I could buy some spare macerator along the way, I'm sure if mine failed, it's a lot nicer to having the exact unit. Right, it drop in. it right in. I don't have to mess about trying yep. to adjust plumbing or wiring so it fits right, we the carry the same. Yeah, and the most common thing to go wrong there are the little duck valves. They will get something jammed in them and that's a pretty easy but not fun thing to clean out. But if your macerator starts to not work, that's the first place to look. If you own a boat with vacuum flush heads, there are a ton of them out there. Carry a ton of duck bills. You can't have too many of them. They seem crazy expensive. They're like 25 bucks for the, the little two rubber pieces. But there are two duck bills on the Sealand macerator pump and they're four duck bills on the pressure pump for the vacuum generator itself. So you can easily go 
through six duck bills in one switch. Also, how do you advise people to take good care of their head and their macerator? Water, use the right TP. Fat. Those are the big ones. Make sure you're using enough water. Also, when you have guests, you want to make sure they know the right way to use the head. But then if you also tell them the resources are limited, mm -hmm. then they might be stingy with the water. And Right. Basically making sure that you're not putting any foreign objects in it is the single biggest thing you can do to help your head operate well. Big wads of toilet paper can present problems. Paper towels or Lysol Kleenex wipes or, or yeah. sanitary wipes or tampons. Tampons are a nightmare in most marine heads. So really making sure that whatever TP you're using is not causing a problem. I personally am too cheap to buy the fancy stuff at the boat store. So I get the most basic Scott single ply septic right. safe and it's been working great. Haven't had any there's, problems with it. There's a really good test you can do. You can take a jar, fill it with water, put one square of your TP in it. If it's double ply, you put the square, you don't peel apart, mm -hmm. but put one square of TP in there, close up the lid and shake it a second. And if it disintegrates, then you're good. And if it doesn't, and you'll see, it's a good test to do actually. Yeah. What you don't want is paper with a bunch of adhesives in it, holding yeah. it together. That stuff just tends to build up over time and clog everything. So we've talked a little bit about pumps by now, but it's worth reiterating. Pumps are generally pretty inexpensive and they're one of the things that fails frequently. And so I carry identical spares for all the pumps. That's domestic fresh water, wash down, macerator, macerator. gray water from the shower. Yep. I've had that pump fail. And in total, I bet I have well under a thousand dollars in spare pumps on board the boat. And it's so nice when one fails just to be able to drop it in quickly and easily and not have to do a big project somewhere out in the middle of nowhere where you probably can't get plumbing parts anyway. Yeah. I'm trying to replumb in a new pump. So write down all the pump numbers, take them to Fisheries or West Marine or wherever you get your boat parts and just order a complete set of spare pumps. Electronics. Having a tablet and smartphone with charts is a really easy way to have good redundancy for your main chart plotter. Yeah, most people already have a smartphone or tablet on board and just having that loaded up with the charts, make sure you've downloaded all the charts before you need them is you may not have internet access when you need them, but that's a great backup. One of the greatest things about using an iPad or other tablet or smartphone as your backup as it has its own battery. So it has yeah. its own independent power source. So if the boat electrical system failed, then you still have an ability to navigate to some kind of safe harbor before all your electronics are dead. Right. And it's got its own battery, its own GPS. It's a complete standalone system. But we also find it nice to have a different kind of chart on our iPad than we do on our Garmin chart plotter, for example, because sometimes one set of charts will have details the others don't. The download the charts in advance. Don't be fooled when you're in a place with always on internet if you're app is constantly loading and unloading chart data as you go along. You can force it to download and keep the chart data you need and that's what you'll want to do for this kind of cruising because a lot of times you won't have internet connection. You'll get somewhere and there will be no chart data. It'll try to get it off the internet and that won't be available either. So be sure you actually force it to download the charts. Another electronic gadget we like to have is the handheld depth sounder and I think we need to replace ours right now. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately they don't seem to be super long lived but no, it, they're nice to but have. They're not that expensive. They're, yeah, they're only mm -hmm. about 50 or $60 dollars. Yeah. Amazon. It's nice to have when you're anchoring all the time, mm -hmm. if something were to happen, your depth sounder is nice to have a backup so that you can figure out how deep the water is. And also sometimes it's nice to get in the dinghy and go and scout out someplace ahead of time. And so if you don't have a sounder in the dinghy that's installed, this allows you to get depth soundings from the dinghy without having to risk taking the bigger boat into some place. Also consider a portable inverter. Yeah, we both have uh, big built-in inverters, whole boat inverters, but occasionally those can fail and having a little portable inverter that you can plug into a cigarette lighter and charge your laptop or other little gadgets can really make things a lot easier until you can go and replace or fix the primary inverter. So a lot of people overlook the dinghy part of the spares and there's a fair number of things to carry actually for this. If you have an inflatable or a deflatable dinghy as I call it, <laughs> you'll want to carry a patch kit for sure. You guys found yeah. something that popped the dinghy when yep, we were on the beach. We at, did. Uh, on the outside of Chichigoff Island so there was no repair flows. We had a repair kit and that was good because that saved our ability to dinghy. All of a sudden we heard this bubbling noise underneath the dinghy and Kevin and I looked at each other and we were oh, on shore. Oh, right. that's what... <laughs> Quick, get to the boat. And so it was the, the race to get back to the boat. There was some piece of old metal on the beach, I think, that mm -hmm. had, had punctured your dinghy. Having a good patch kit is important. Also for the outboard, having some spare parts, I carry a spare prop. You're going to be landing on rocky beaches all the time and it's not uncommon to ding props. Dinghy props are pretty inexpensive. I think for my 15 Yamaha, it was about 50 
$50 for a dinghy prop. And make sure you have a spare prop nut and the prop wrench to change this. I like carrying some spare spark plugs, again, an inexpensive part. And finally, a spare pull starter on the engine. Those occasionally will fail, and it's good to have a spare cord. You could make some other line work in a pinch, but mm -hmm. uh, it's good to have some kind of spare starting cord with you in case you need it. Let's move on to tools. Tools is a pretty big list and will vary by... Well, right, and all these spare parts we're talking about carrying aren't going to do you any good if you don't have the tools to, put to actually in. put them in. And it's a really good thing in general to get to know your own boat and what tools are required to do the normal thing. So anytime you have to go get a tool to do something on your boat, then from then on, keep that tool in your boat. The basics you want to have, you want to have a socket set and you probably for most boats will need to have both metric and English socket sizes because in our case, for example, we have an engine that was made in Europe, so a lot of those things are metric, and the boat was made in the U.S., so a lot of the things there are English, and yep. you need both types. You want to carry pliers of various sizes. We like to carry some needle nose and some regular pliers. Strap wrenches come in really handy for pulling off filters, for any time you need to have it grip around something larger and be able to torque something off there. The strap wrenches are inexpensive and great to have on board. The Mega Pro. <laughs> the Mega Pro screwdriver. The Mega Pro screwdriver <laughs> is our go-to tool. It's one of these swap out bits, keeps all the bits in the handle, but it is by far the highest quality of those all-in-one kind of screwdrivers we found. It's got all the squares that we need. Yep. Right, all the different square and, mm -hmm. and torques and hex and Phillips and slot and all the different sizes of those all in one thing that's really easy to, to manage and use. We now have one on the boat, we have one at home, we have one in the Airstream. <laughs> um, and we also carry an assortment of regular screwdrivers, especially including some stubby ones for places that a normal length screwdriver can't reach into and so forth. Yeah, I find right angle drive screwdrivers are really helpful in the boat. There are a lot of times when you can reach something, but you don't have enough clearance to use a normal screwdriver, even a stubby screwdriver. Yeah. So having a right angle driver is good. Yeah. You might need to have an impeller puller for your particular impeller. So I would recommend if you've changed your own impeller at least once before you leave home, that way you know how to do it and you have the right tools. Vice grips can come in really handy, especially for all the normal reasons, as well as Sam was talking about, what if your coolant in your water heater fails? And one thing you could do there to prevent all your coolant from leaking out would be to clamp off the hose with vice grips if it doesn't have a valve in it already. So vice grips have a lot of uses and they're fantastic. I would not be on a boat without an assortment of vice grips. As we mentioned before, a clamp multimeter is your go-to tool for anything electric along with your wire strippers and clippers and so forth. A hammer or mallet is nice to have. There are a lot of times you need to bang on something and that... <laughs> it's a really good emotional tool to have when the, <laughs> when the no, piece Sam. of equipment is not working anymore. You start wailing on it no, with a hammer. Uh... <laughs> it's a little more sophisticated than using a rock also. <laughs> Be sure you have an assortment of Allen and hex wrenches. There are also some that allow a little bit of a wobble and I recommend those because a lot of times you can't get square onto the Allen or hex wrench that you're trying to adjust so it's nice to be able to go in at a slight angle and still have it work. Um, um, infrared thermometer is good as well. We've used that quite a few times. Oh, we use it quite a bit. Super handy. A lot of them have a little laser spot that puts a dot on the thing that you're measuring the temperature of and it reads the temperature out. A lot of times we from outside the engine room will just open the engine room, point the thing down in there and measure the temperature at certain points underway and kind of reference that to what we're used to seeing. So it's a great diagnostic tool. Yeah, it's really a nice way to confirm that the gauge is accurate right. or inaccurate. There's no guesswork involved then. If you're seeing high temperatures or low temperatures, temperatures on the dashboard gauge, it's nice to be able to get in the engine room and confirm whether or not that's an actual problem or if it's a gauge problem. Right. Right. And, and then the final tool that's maybe nice to have is the satellite phone and a credit card. Yes, there are. Uh... <laughs> when all else fails. <laughs> when all else fails. Having a sat phone and a credit card handy is... Yeah, make sure it's got a high limit. <laughs> pretty good tool. Pretty good tool. So let's talk about some of the other supplies. We've talked about some of these before. The extra diapers, those oil absorbing cloths. Really nice to have a good supply of those. Yeah. Occasionally you'll make a mess in the engine room. You'll have a leak and you'll want a bunch of those to help clean things up. Also, I like keeping fresh ones underneath the engine. So if I make a yeah. mess during an oil change, I like to swap them out. Yep. Rescue tape. This is a miracle product. I think they call it self-amalgamating. <laughs> and it's not sticky to the touch, but it sticks to itself. So you can wrap hoses or yeah. you can put it on a wet surface and you just really want to cinch it down. And, and the, it'll withstand high temps and mm -hmm. high pressure. It's great. It's really useful. It's good for, for electrical insulation in a pinch. So if you have, mm -hmm. have to repair some wiring or I wouldn't recommend splicing wires together with rescue tape but <laughs> but if you need to waterproof a connection in a 
pinch and don't have something else that's a good option. Comes in all colors. Yeah, similarly amazing is the Splash Zone Epoxy. Should you ever get a hole in anything made of fiberglass, for example, great to be able to do a field repair, get back to the marina or home or wherever you need to get back to. Uh-huh, we've used it on hot water tanks. People use it on holes in the bottom of the boat. They've hit something. It's very useful stuff, tenacious stuff. And speaking of holes in the bottom of the boat, it's good to have at least one of these multi-size kind of bungs that you could poke into a hole in a pinch. Or uh, Nerf football would also work. I have heard some people say, yeah, that they carry a Nerf football. <laughs> Double says playtime. Various hoses and hose clamps. And I particularly like the AWAB brand hose clamps or ABBA brand hose clamps, ABA. These are dramatically better built than the more conventional, I think they call them ideal hose clamps, one of the brands. They're smooth on the inside, so they don't tend to pinch the hose that you're clamping down on. They're made out of a higher grade of stainless, typically. They just are much better built, beefier and stronger. And then don't forget zip ties. These things are endlessly Ooh, yeah. useful. Duct tape, various types of tape. There's an almost limitless list of things. I like having some various 3M sealants, so 4,000 and 5,200, some silicone, although I, I generally don't like using silicone, but it can be helpful to seal up a window in a pinch mm -hmm. if there's a leak, or really an assortment of a miscellaneous marine supplies. A lot of this comes from other projects you might have worked on. You used half a tube of something. Don't throw that away. Keep it on board for the next time you need it. Also as important as preparing the boat is to prepare yourself. You know, it's good if you know how to do the most common repairs yourself, the things that would cause you to be dead in the water, because you're going to be out in areas where you're not close to anybody else who can help you. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're three or four hours from the nearest port and you're stopped in the water, you really want to know how to do the most common right. things that it's Changing likely your to be. Changing your fuel filter, clearing or cleaning out your raw water strainer if your intake's clogged, mm -hmm. changing your raw water impeller. Those are things that'd be really great if you knew how to do before you took off on a trip like this. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're somewhere remote, you can drop an anchor, go down in the engine room and do any of these tasks in a few minutes. They don't require a lot of mechanical skill. They just right. require a basic understanding of your boat and how these particular things work. And I would recommend everybody know how to do at least these three things at a minimum with their own hands. Yeah. Another thing is to know where you can get parts. And so for Americans that are cruising through Canada or Canadians that are cruising in Alaska, your normal part source is probably not going to be your best option because they're going to have to deal with customs issues as they get the part across the border. So make sure that you know in country where you can get your parts and look up in advance for your major equipment, your main engine and so forth. Find distributors in the country that you'll be in so that you can order directly and you don't have to wait for the part to get through customs. And then how to get parts is also nice. I mean, the small local airlines in Alaska are great. Yep. My fuel hose for my outboard broke last year in Glacier Bay and there was no, no part nearby. <laughs> it frustrated me to no end. <laughs> But eventually I called up an outfit in Juneau and had them put the part on a Alaska seaplanes flight out to Pelican where we were. The part arrived, it was same day shipping. I think it cost me about 15 bucks because it went on a scheduled flight. Yeah, it's great. And it saved me a long trip back to Juneau just to get this little $20 part. And so those small airlines can get you parts almost anywhere. If necessary, you could even charter a flight and have a mechanic fly in. Mm -hmm. But then we're talking big money there. There gets back to that credit card thing. Alaska Airlines Gold Street is a nice service if you have people in Seattle that can drop off parts at the airport. What happens is the part gets delivered to the Alaska Air Cargo desk at SeaTac. Alaska puts it on their next available flight and you pick it up at the destination airport. So if you fly into cool. Sitka or Juneau, you just go to the airport and pick up your part at the cargo desk. Fishery Supply in Seattle is used to dealing with this so they can... So they'll drop it off for you? They have go down to the airport regularly and drop cool. parts off. I've used that before and it's a really great way to get parts up into Alaska. You can also have some things shipped to marinas, but there's a lot of marinas that won't accept packages. Mm-hmm for you. We found in Ketchikan, Frontier Shipping is fantastic. We yeah. have many packages shipped to Frontier Shipping. And for just a few dollars, they'll hold a... A dollar per package. Yeah. They'll, they'll hold, hold it up a package. to a year. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to go get stuff once you get there. The other good thing to do is general delivery at right. USPS so you can have it shipped and held at a post office. Yep, we've done that in Juneau. And actually, the post office is really the best way to get parts into Alaska. They yeah. seem to have the most reliable service. UPS and FedEx can be tremendously slow. Do not. And parts seem to get lost in the in yep. the mail. And, and We so had to order a part and we specified it has to go USPS. We're waiting for it. We're on the hard. Please don't send it any <laughs> other way besides US Postal Service. 
service and they sent it FedEx thinking they were being helpful and mm -hmm. we ended up having to take a bus out to the oh. FedEx office at the airport and pick which it up. Is, and which it is, took, I recall, is open it, about two hours two a day. Two hours a day. <laughs> and it took like five days to get there. It was terrible. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, that's all for this presentation. I hope, that was a you, lot. hope you learned something and if you have any comments or questions, feel free to let us know in the comment section below. Yeah, and thanks a lot for joining us. To see more of our educational boating videos, subscribe to our Slow Boat YouTube channel. If you're on Facebook, you can follow us at facebook.com slash slowboatlife. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at slowboatlife. And of course, you can always find us on slowboat.com. Until next time, see you on the water.